Welcome to Firefighting Today, the weekly video roundtable discussion show where we discuss all things fire service related. Firefighting Today is a production of PeteLamb.com. And now your host, Chief Peter Lamb. Welcome and good evening. It's a pleasure to have everybody with us tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, a little bit about incident command tonight. We've got a full panel here. I, I joked with the crew earlier, there's no staffing shortage on the uh, Firefighting Today roundtable tonight. Um, I it, Social media did say that you are getting in the mind of the folks in the fire SUV. So I love that. Uh, credit, to, uh, credit to Chief Woolery for that. So first and foremost, if you are uh, watching us live on YouTube, uh, feel free to leave a YouTube comment. Um, we'll try to get you into the panel. We'll try to get your comment or your question into the panel and uh, put it in at the appropriate time. So we'll make sure that that happens. If you are watching on one of the web pages and not on YouTube, uh, but you want to use Twitter, uh, feel free to uh, send an at Pete Lamb. And uh, we are also monitoring that. So we will be able to uh, we will be able to take your questions and comments and snide remarks and all of that stuff uh, right then and there. So let's get the panel introduced, a uh, big panel. We got a new, uh, uh, an old new player. Uh, Captain Captain Owens is with us and it's uh, always a pleasure to have him on board, but let's, uh, let's introduce the panel. So uh, let's start with Brad. Hey Chief, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, Brad Dockery, Captain with Naval Station Norfolk Fire. Okay, uh, Chief Hall. Good evening, everyone. Charlie Hall, a retired chief officer here in West Walk, Rhode Island. Thank you for having me. You're welcome, Charlie. Always a pleasure. Chief Starnes, Joe Starnes, say hello. Hey, Chief Lamb, this is Joe Starnes. Killed a flashover, Oak Grove Volunteer Fire Department in previous Sand Ridge. Uh, thank you for having me, sir. Always a pleasure, Joe. Chief Cagno, say hello. Welcome, Chief. Uh, happy to be here again. Uh, John Cagno, retired battalion chief out of North Providence and founder of Lead It. Thanks, John. Chief Burns. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Kevin Burns, retired deputy fire chief of the Framingham Fire Department. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure, Kevin. Chief Woolery, say hello. Uh, hello, uh, Lane Woolery, Battalion Chief with uh, San Diego Fire Rescue. And uh, the chief is on duty tonight, so if we see him disappear, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully grab him on the way back. Uh, Captain Owens, introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, tell the folks where you're from. Uh, Robbie Owens, Captain with Enrico Fire, and uh, we're, have the uh, firefighter blog, AverageJakeFirefighter.com. Sounds good. Thanks for joining us tonight, Robbie. Uh, chief Fling, say hello. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me, Pete. Rob Fling. I'm an ex-chief with the Dix Hills Fire Department on Long Island. Excellent. Excellent. Chief Whitley. Hi, guys. Warren Whitley, retired assistant chief from Prince William. And as you can tell, it's a little chilly on the porch tonight. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, all right. So um, a couple of simple things. I want to just run the panel. I'm just going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with you, Warren. We're just going to run the panel in most inst in most instances um, in your world, in your organization, are you in a fixed command? That is either you, are you in a vehicle or attached to the rear of a vehicle or are you kind of a uh, front yard sort of situation? Let's just get that out of the way, and then we'll start with the uh, with the meat of the matter. Chief Whitley, uh, in your organization, is it fixed? Are you in the vehicle? What's that look like? Yeah, generally fixed, either in the front seat or at the back with the uh, tailgate up with the command board, the bigger board spread up. Okay. Rob? Uh, I was the same way, Chief. Um, I either operated out of the back of my, mostly out of the back of my truck. Okay. Um, Captain Owens, what goes on in your world? Uh, so I have the opportunity to ride up as part of our command team, as part of as a uh, ALS captain. So I can act as a battalion and I can act as a, as a EMS supervisor. And in our world, we do a fixed command. We either are in the car or at the back of the car with the command board. 
Excellent, excellent. Lane, how does it work in San Diego? Well, it's a uh, fixed command at the back of the car. You know, they've spent a lot of money building some pretty nice command suites for us back there that it'd uh, be a shame not to use them. Excellent, excellent. excellent. Chief Burns. Well, I'm going to uh, say something different. Chief, I'm, I'm a front lawn guy or in the street guy, uh, mostly away from the car. We can talk about the reasons why. If it was a real big incident, I can see myself closer to the car, more of a strategic type thing. But uh, mostly I'm on the front lawn, want to see the building, want to see the guys. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's why we're having, you know what, this is uh, this is like Baskin Robbins here. There's 31 flavors. Uh, no, nobody's, nobody's right or wrong here. I mean, we can, we can share our information the way we need to. Uh, Chief Cagno, in your world, uh, what were you doing most of the time? Uh, usually similar to uh, what Chief Burns is saying, uh, usually the, the front of the fire building uh, in close proximity to uh, the battalion chief's vehicle. Okay. Um, Joe Steins, uh, been chief in a couple of places. What, uh, how did it work? Is it different now? What do you, uh, what do you typically see, Joe? Well, different now. We, uh, we're out in the front lawn until they go inside and then we're fixed position once anybody's inside. Yeah, that's an interesting distinction, right? So I'll, I'll walk around in the front lawn for a while, but once I got crews in, maybe I'd do something different. That's kind of a, that's, that's a unique take. Uh, chief Hall. Uh, similar to Chief Burns and Chief Cagno, uh, in the street, front of the front of the building where the numbers are, uh, close proximity to the to the buggy, and usually I'll have I have the luxury to assign somebody uh, back and forth to the rig to get me information or just uh, describe information. But I like to have uh, I like to have eyes on what's going on. Okay, and last and certainly not least is Brad. We do a fixed command back of the car. Fixed command back of the car. And I would just say, I didn't answer the question myself. I, I would say that most of my career was uh, was a front lawn. Then I realized that I need to back up. I was out in the street, father. And then ultimately, I got to a fixed command position, which is the way I ended uh, the, the way I was doing things. So I can't say that I got any smarter or any worse, but uh, uh, that's the way that worked in my world. So uh, talking about, uh, uh, welcome to John Haywick. John, thanks for uh, being with us. And Greg Howard is with us from uh, from Canada across the border. And he says that they have an initial command for smaller incidents unless a, chief's, a chief officer arrives. And if a chief officer arrives, it then gets run from a command truck typically. So uh, thank you, Greg and John and, and so forth. So uh, good stuff. So we're going to start with Brad, because I think that most people, let's just take this in some logical order, which is rare for us on the Five Fighting Today roundtable, but we're going to try it. So Brad, you are a company officer. Talk about how you ride. Are you in the building? Are you, so, you know, how big's your company? And, and what does command look like for you being a first arriving officer? That's the kind of the snapshot I'm looking for. We're a four-man engine company. Uh, for most calls, I'm inside the building with the company, uh, passing reports back to command, all we find. My area is predominantly big box, pre-World War II, so large facilities. We might not get conditions on the outside. We're going to find it later when we get in. So I'm, a, I'm an inside guy with my men. Is there any reason, and I like that, I mean, that's a good answer. I think that makes a lot of sense. Tell me a reason you would not enter. So, in other words, you're the you're the company officer. If the whole crew is going defensive, if at any point your crew's going, are you going? Is that your trigger? What would trigger you not to enter as the commander? If we find ourselves in a VEIS scenario, staying on the outside, letting my crew handle what needs to be done. Okay, okay, that makes that makes some sense. That makes some sense. Um, Let's go over to Rob Fling. Rob, from a volunteer perspective, you got a lot of options. Uh, you were chief officer over in Dix Hills. Um, you had times that you arrived first. You had times that you arrived after the the uh, the movie had already started. The previews were run and the movie had started. So uh, talk about what you're looking for. How does that differ in your world? And, and tell me what that's like. 
Uh, if I arrived first, you know, obviously what I generally tried to do with my truck was I usually tried to take the driveway across the street um, from the address. So I had my vehicle at my disposal if I needed it, as well as um, I always wanted to have a good view of the building. Um, if I arrived, when I arrived first, I would, you know, do an initial size up, get on the radio, let the dispatcher know what I had so he could get it out. Um, and start giving instructions to my incoming units. If I arrived later in the event, sometimes I arrived after the first engine. Depends where I was coming from. I, I, if we caught a job during the day, I might come come from work. Um, but I always tried to um, it, at least meet up initially with whoever was taking command and uh, get briefed before I was past command. Okay. Makes sense. Um, let's. I'm. I'm going to get another volunteer perspective in a minute from uh, Chief Steins, but um, Captain Owens. So you're riding on a company. Is there ever a time? Would you stand outside and send a couple of firefighters in, or as the company officer, not acting up, but as the company officer, uh, would you be inside with the crew or outside? What's your What's your command position, if you will? So uh, our uh, engine companies, and it pretty basically every suppression piece rides with three, which is a driver, a company officer, and a firefighter. So there's usually no situation where I don't uh, go inside with the guys. Uh, you usually how it kind of works is you arrive on scene, give a size up, you know, from the cab of the rig, uh, get out. I immediately do do my 360 while the backwards guy pulls a line to the door, whatever announce our operational mode, either interior or exterior. Uh, and then I help, I, you know, essentially go to work as a, as we kind of call it a combat commander or working supervisor. Uh, you know, even when we, the rare chance we ride with four people, that just to me is a force multiplier. I'm going to use that person to where I can actually be a company officer, not have to be the backup guy on the hose line and maybe like go in front of them, find the fire so we can make an easier stretch. But there's, you know, very rarely, if ever, would I be outside in the front yard while the, the guys are inside from a company officer perspective. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I think that's common. We, we have heard recently of some cases where even with a three or a four man company, we've I, I've just had some experience where somebody was staying outside because they had to be in command. And this was not a defensive op. So, I mean, I get it. I, I, I get the principles of it, but I want to, I want the listeners and the viewers to understand that we're talking about safety is paramount, obviously, but we also are talking about real world scenarios. Um, uh, Chief Woolery, is there any, I know you're a BC in a, in a large organization, but is it common for, would, would an officer on a piece uh, ever, ever stay outside or would they always be with the crew? Actually, uh, believe it or not, it's a uh, it's an expectation of our first in uh, company officer to take command and uh, get a 360 and then deploy the remainder of the incoming alarm until, you know, one of us BCs gets there. So actually, uh, and that that's a gap. I mean, we do have firefighters making the initial entry to the door and, and doing that sort of stuff on their own, sometimes without a captain with them. Typically, the second in engine will... Uh, Captain will be assigned as the fire attack group supervisor, and they run that and, and lead the uh, fire attack. But there can be a period of time where there's firefighters operating interior on their own uh, without a captain with them. And, you know, we, we recognize that there's a potential gap there, but it's a trade-off for the, the organized deployment of the first alarm. Yeah, I mean, the point is we're talking about incident command stuff, and there is an argument that can be made very, very easily to be made that if I am not in command, and, and uh, I think we're going to hear a little bit about that from, from uh, Chief Steins in a minute, you know, failure to take command can let this operation go down the tubes pretty quickly. Now, can you be in command with a portable radio? You certainly don't have the wide angle viewpoint uh, certainly, but can you be in command in real life? You call yourself command or whatever. Um, and I, I liked uh, uh, Robbie's words there, uh, uh, you know, combat command or, or what was the other you, was supervisor? What was the other term you used, Cap? Yeah, so like we, we do a working supervisor. So like uh, the chief said, we're, uh, we're expected to take command. The first in unit is expected to take command, but we're also expected to work. And so, like I said, we're a working supervisor, a combat command, and 
usually our BCs or our, whoever shows up first on our command team will immediately take it uh, from us. And so we try to front load all of that, you know, by using a, 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 a response matrix and all that stuff so that the radio traffic from the first and officer can be minimal as possible, 360 or operational mode and get in there and get to work. Okay. Okay. Well said. Well said. John's uh, talking about, um, John Haywick from New Jersey is talking about as a truck company officer. He, he says he has to go in. There's only a driver officer and one. He's got to get in, do recon, provide a conditions action, needs report to the incoming officers. They're sort of in a mobile command situation. Uh, Greg says that we often make entry as a fire attack team without an officer. We run four-man rigs, and the cap would remain outside as the initial IC as first do. So uh, we've heard we've heard some uh, some variety there as as well. Chief Stans, a couple things: a failure failure to um, um, if if nobody's in command, that's one issue. And Rob talked about running a volunteer organization. How does this thing get complicated? If you're in a volunteer rural setting, what have you, and uh, we don't, uh, we're not training with them. We don't know. I mean, is it different when you're commanding mutual aid, I guess, would be my question to you, Joe. Uh, we have experienced quite a bit of issues when you're trying to do something differently. And uh, there's, you know, the, the bottom line is the best way to do it is train together. If you can train together, you can fix it. But if you can't or haven't, you have a problem of real time. What are you doing right now? Kind of issue. And uh, we, we've tried to do several things, but bottom line is if you're, if you don't have a strong command structure in our world, then there's a lot of freelancing goes on with mutual aid. And so we have to keep re encourage, encouraging our officers that they must have a strong command structure. And so when they come in, they're liable to do things the way they do them, whether you do them differently or not. And, it, and the other thing is you're not training, you're not doing company training countywide. So they're doing it differently. One department's doing it differently than the other. So it gets to be very complicated on the fire ground. So, so go further with that. So what does that mean in real life as the commander? So do I have to be, do I have to increase my level of supervision? Do I have to be more, am I, am I at that point tangled up managing tasks? I'm actually given assignments. Uh, is that what happens there, Joe? How do you manage that? Well, some of that is that chief, obviously, some of that is broken down and it breaks down as it's trying to be done. Uh, I, one of the things I've found helpful is script, what I call command scripts. In other words, the commander will come on and say, no, do not open doors or windows without command and direction. They'll come over the radio and say that. And, and so we call it a command scripts. So you, you've got a couple of those when you're trying to change things or do things a little differently than maybe they've done them for the last 30, 40 years. There's, you warn them as much as you can. The other thing is, I think you do put a lot more micromanagement until you learn it. You know, I think that I think that's a real a real deal. Uh, I wish it was different, but it's not. Uh, the other piece is that you take some more what I call coaching. You may have to assign a volunteer to a crew that's not your crew, so that they are in you know, are enabled with whatever the processes and procedures are. Uh, again, the right way is to go train together. But in, in the absence of that, then people do what they want to do sometimes. Did yeah, I, ask I, you a yeah I, I, think that, uh, I, I think that does make some sense in some cases because you, have, you, you almost have to assign one of your personnel as a translator. Here's how we do it in Oak Grove. Here's how we do it over here. Uh, if you've got mutual aid that is unfamiliar with you, then I think that that's probably the case. And you almost have to, we call it a coach, but you almost have to put a coach on anything anyway, because if, if a new volunteer shows up from another department and hadn't been around for the orientations that have taken place, they're liable to do some things that you don't want them to do. For instance, let's say they like to break glass. What is it? Ben, the last slang, Vinnie Vince a lot. You know, if you got somebody who likes to break glass, then you, you, you've got to get someone with them so that they don't do that. And then heaven help you if the other department doesn't work in crews. And right. it's, worked, 
walks around and just see something they think needs to be done and they do it. Yeah. And I think one of the lessons, one of the first lessons of tonight's discussion is, you know, something that the audience can take away is that when you are commanding your own troops, you may behave in a certain manner. Uh, when you are commanding in a mutual aid situation uh, is, is a big deal. I think it makes a difference. Chief Cagno, you were responding on a career department as a battalion chief. When you arrived on scene, what, what were the kinds of things, what, as a commander, as an IC arriving on scene with an established first alarm assignment, uh, what, what are some of the things you were thinking about? Uh, well, basically, my command starts uh, you know, after the initial alarm is uh, transmitted and the company's arriving, arrival sequence plays a big role as to what I do. But my thinking starts as soon as the uh, first company's uh, arrive on scene and uh, dictate uh, what they have and what they're doing. And then uh, I use an acronym uh, myself uh, that, I, that I call PULSE, which is basically uh, uh, determining you know, what, what, what's the progress of the incident uh, prior to my arrival or, or just immediately following my arrival. Uh, what's being done? What's what's working? What's not? What's not working? Um, going into uh, undetermined and un unaddressed issues. Uh, you know, uh, our company's being effective. Uh, our lines being stretched. Uh, is the building getting shaken up? You know, truck companies going to work. Um, followed by, uh, you know, what are my logistical needs? Do I have enough personnel on the scene? Um, have additional alarms been struck? Uh, should they be struck? And uh, what do I need to stabilize this incident? So uh, basically, I try to get a, what I describe as a pulse on, on, on the incident. Uh, and then that dictates, uh, you know, how I, I operate from a command standpoint. Excellent. Excellent. So you're, uh, you're kind of asking the questions when you arrive, similar to when I arrived. The first question I would ask when I arrived, if I was second or third or 80th do or whatever it was, is what do you need from me? Tell me what's going on. You know, the, the National Fire Academy years and years ago had this, this uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I want to say a, an acronym, but it really wasn't. And, the bit, you know, the questions are, what have I got? Where is it going? And what do I need to control it? And I just hung on to that because I think as a chief officer, I'm going to arrive and I'm going to transition that. That's what I want to know. What have I got? Where is it going? What, you know, what's your assessment from one of these first new offices? Give me some assessment. Tell me what's going on. And I'm kind of going to be the person. I see the job of an IC, other than the initial IC that's passing babies out the window and, and life safety and making rescues. That's a big deal. But I think as, a, as an IC, my job is to support the efforts, to support the ongoing efforts. I'll get you the resources we need to do this and, and we'll create the mission that allows us to do that. I'm going to go over to... Um, I'm going to go over to Warren in a second about uh, larger scale incidents and rap rapidly escalating incidents, but let's hit the, uh, let's hit the chat room for a second. Um, I, I missed Chuck early on. Chuck said, uh, keep crews together. Obviously, crew integrity is very, very important. Um, uh, uh, John says that the captain would go in as fast attack until the BC picks it up. Um, John Haywick says interior ops and division officer provides better supervision. And Chuck makes an interesting point with less fires in cities trying to lower the amount of firefighters on staff. We are increasing the need for mutual aid. If mutual aid comes to his city, we try to set up a liaison who would act sort of like an IC. And then, uh, John's talking about John Haywick is also talking about the sit stat report, which I think is, is kind of what I'm talking about. Robbie, go ahead, dive in. Um, so just to, to, to comment on what the – it's about giving crews up for adoption. Uh, then that's well, Or just keeping crews there. That's what one of the my mentors said. You don't ever give your crews up for adoption. Usually as a company officer, like when I get – if I was in an initial command role or something like that, we usually transition into like a division or group supervisor role. And I usually uh, – you usually have like that – you know, you're taking that interior command role almost – well, I use the crew that's with me. If I have another person with me, that becomes their role too. So now I have two sets of eyes on that division. Uh, so, you know, basically I had a, a fire where I was put as a division two commander and 
or Division Two supervisor, and I had the guy with me basically stand at the stairs as like anybody that comes up here, you don't let them come up here unless they talk to me, and you don't let anybody go down there unless they talk to me. You know, so that kind of like you know, again, not giving your crew up for adoption is a great thing. I, I personally think I'm gonna you know use that to enhance the command and help that IC on the outside get better information with more eyes. Yeah, it sounds great, and it sounds great, and it also uh, leads to some accountability, integrity, and all that kind of stuff. So it uh, it certainly uh, takes it in. Uh, Greg is in an interesting position up there in Canada. He said, we do not have mutual aid. Four companies, and we're out of manpower until a call-in crew arrives. There's probably more to that story. I'd like to hear the rest of that story. The only place I ever heard of like that was uh, here in New England, uh, one of the islands off of Massachusetts, Nantucket uh, Island has a 21-person career department. It's four or five-man shifts. And basically, after two bottles, uh, they're, they're done. I mean, they're on an island. Um, and uh, they literally fly in command offices uh, by small plane. There is a steamship authority that will actually turn around a ferry midstream, load fire trucks on it, and take it back. So it's, uh, it's kind of an amazing mutual aid system, to say the least. Um, Large-scale incidents. Let's talk about Chief Whitley. You're, uh, you're a senior officer. You're getting called in from, from some delay, probably. You're not responding on the first alarm. And this is a rapidly escalating incident. Be specific. Talk about the things you're looking for. What's your expectations and, and what kind of things are you, are you doing, Warren? I'm trying to... Oh, I'm off mute. Thanks. The, um, <clears throat> usually... Part of it is how far do I have to go to get there? Um, listening to the radio, trying to gather some intel, see what they got. You know, hopefully I was listening for the initial stuff, but a lot of times, if, you know, I was in the office doing stuff, I wasn't. So when you get the second or third alarm and the assistant chiefs are on the way, then, you know, things aren't going so well. Um, so I'm looking at, you know, get a sit rep when I get there from the BC, whoever's in command at the moment, see what he needs from me, what resources does he have, what resources doesn't he have that he would really like to have, then kind of figure out, well, what's the impact period before we can get them there? Where is it going to go? You know, try and think in that mindset. And uh, try and get, if I have time, do a, a, my own 360 to see what's going on, depending on the size of the structure. Uh, and then start nudging him to make sure he's thought of all the other important things like building construction, what's its impact on what we're doing, as the fire progressed to be in fuel limited or is it still vent limited, we can do some good. You know, what mode is he in? Is he an offensive or defensive attack? Things like that. Do we have mutual aid coming? Is it necessary? The nice thing up where we were or where I was is most of the mutual aid would come from the rest of Northern Virginia and we all had the same operations manual. So Fairfax and Loud and all those folks, we all, we all operated from the same basic uh, SOPs, which was nice. So basically, see what see what he needs from me. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's yeah, that's the question. What do you want? What what do you need me to What do you need me to fix? Uh, you just raised an interesting point. Uh, resources on the scene. We'll talk about uh, uh, staging in a minute. Uh, you know how important is it, Warren, for uh, these these third alarm? Would you stage? At what point would you begin to stage an additional alarm? Uh, close to the scene, level one stage, and out, you know, at some some position a little bit closer by. I'm I'm sure you're backfilling stations, but uh, at what point, Warner, would you start uh, staging? So as soon as they call for the additional resources, they they are automatically sent to staging, and it's up to the whoever the, the initial incident commander to figure out where that's going to be, and then he'll assign somebody to be the staging officer and, and herd the cats over there. Right, right. Um, well, we were lucky enough, though. A first alarm was five engines, two trucks, and a heavy rescue and assorted ancillary stuff. So you know, you're talking initially 27 to 36 bodies. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great first alarm. People would, uh, people would be dying to have that kind, of, uh, that kind of response. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Robbie, you had a comment or a question on that one? You did not. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Charlie, go ahead. As a senior chief officer, uh, when summoned to a scene of a working incident, um, I would uh, 
again gather intel over the radio on my way into the scene and then uh when i got there uh i would uh every command what had been set up uh, check in with the senior officer usually battalion chief and uh find out how they thought the incident was going and then i made the time to do my own 360. i want to see for myself if we need to sector this uh if we need to, to uh the sector off this incident again it's all depending on the length and breadth of the incident if we need to sector it off into uh, uh different areas uh and then i'll go back and um i don't always didn't always feel it was my responsibility to take command the incident was going well the battalion chief had a good handle on it even if it was still out of control things were going well and uh, resources were being summoned i didn't see the need to always take command uh I took command when I had to. I took command under three circumstances. If I knew myself that the incident was overwhelming to the battalion chief and the, and the resources that were there. Secondly, if the battalion chief asked me to take command, which never happened, thankfully. And thirdly, quite frankly, if the incident was going so poorly that I thought we had to undo some things and then uh, had to hit the reset. Uh, fortunately, that only happened maybe once. Um, I was blessed with 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 a quality cadre of battalion chiefs and captains who were excellent at the job, and I was uh, very comfortable to let them do their jobs. Um, again, as you said, Chief Lamb, said, what do you need from me? What can I do to help? And then basically just step back and uh, and kind of watch and be another set of eyes on the incident. All right, makes some sense, Chief Cagno. I think you wanted to dive in there at some point. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh... To mention that uh, the worst thing you could probably do is uh, is, is change the order of events uh, once you get there. If, you know, e even if things aren't going dramatically smooth, uh, the worst thing you can do is upset the tempo uh, and start making you know drastic uh, um, moves. Uh, so you know, basically, when you get there, you know, and you, and you determine the, you know which way progress is flowing. I think your primary role at that point is to just uh, try to even out the tempo of the operation, you know, and, and transition it um, more to a uh, relaxed, smooth operation if that's where it needs to go or, uh, you know, if it has to go in a different direction that you do that in a, in an even tempo as well. I think the worst thing you do is to come in and, uh, and start making dramatic changes. Yeah, well, I would agree in most normal circumstances, but it, I, I also don't want to leave the viewer with the, with the note that says, don't change it if you don't really like what's going on. If things are going uh, out of sync, I'm not going to allow that to continue much longer. Um, I'm not going to allow that to go too far. Um, yeah, I want to hear from, uh, I want to hear from uh, Lane, uh, but I do want to just get one comment out of the, it. Because there's a little time delay here, I want to just go backwards just a bit. Um, uh, Joe, Joe Bax is out there, and he says that he's from a small combination department. They arrived with two or three in the first engine, followed by a volunteer response from his own department and automatic aid different from mutual aid, it's coming automatically. It is pretty hard not to go to work as an initial officer. So I think that's a, a, a point well taken. Uh, John talks about manpower being uh, at a premium. Uh, talks about his alarm. We have a question from Greg, a question for the panel. What is a typical first alarm assignment and what does the command structure look like in your world? I'm going to, I'm going to hold that one for a minute, Greg, but I will get to that. We'll, we'll talk about what the first alarm looks like uh, and, uh, and we'll make that happen. Um, go ahead, uh, Ra um, Lane. Actually, I, I got Lane on the hook. So Lane, you wanted to dive in. Well, yeah, you know, you're talking about uh, changing things, you know, as, as the operations in progress and um, like we, you know, because of our wildland situation, when I pull up on an expanding wildland incident, the things that I want to know is what's our organizational structure that's already in place, you know, do we have the right divisions, branches, things like that in place and is that organizational structure going to work for me moving it forward in the incident or, or am I going to have to make some adjustments to it? know of course what resources we have at scene already and then what we have on order because you know if there's a situation where i want to 
you know, we want to run some dozers or we want to bring in some fixed wing aircraft and we haven't ordered them yet, then that obviously that tactic's not going to work because it takes a while to get those things there to scene. Right, right. And that, you know, that's the whole issue of reflex time. As an incident commander, when you say strike the second alarm, the fact is you needed that second alarm right now. The fact is there is a response time, a turnout time, and all of those things that go with that that are, that are going to affect that in some way, shape, or form. Um, Robbie, you got something? No. Okay. Um, I, I thought I saw something there. Um, all right. Let's answer uh, Greg's question, and that is uh, let's just run down the panel real quickly. So tell me the number of resources and the number of bodies. Uh, so, Brad, in your world, what, what does a typical first alarm look like? Um, you know, the best you get, a commercial first alarm or whatever. So how many pieces of apparatus and how many people will run the panel pretty quickly on this one? We're getting uh, three engines, ladder, heavy rescue, and a chief officer with roughly 15 to 16 people. And right. if you're not seeing the declare a working incident, we're getting an additional chief officer. Yeah, that's it. It, it. Listen, we just described everybody's worst nightmare tonight. We got nine chief officers on the panel here, right? So uh, Robbie's a captain acting up. So, you know, you, the last thing you want is this as a command staff. I can tell you that for sure. Um, Charlie, what's, uh, what was the dispatch for a commercial first alarm? Number of resources, number of people? Uh, we're rolling in with uh, three engine companies, two ladder companies, a heavy rescue and EMS unit, and a battalion chief. So uh, approximately 20 to 21 personnel. Okay. Chief Cag, no, uh, Joe, I'm sorry, I skipped you, Joe. Uh, Joe Steins, what's the turnout like at uh, two in the afternoon for you or maybe six in the evening? How is the manpower different? Well, our, our worst times are 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, we get three companies on a structure fire. We get three automatic, we get one department, two automatic aids. Our process is set up on 10 responders. So uh, we don't get that at six in the morning on Tuesday morning or nine in the morning on Tuesday morning. So it, it, it's different. But uh, matter of fact, the county has just went to pay uh, part time for that, that particular time frame every day, Monday through Friday. So it is an issue and uh, we never know, the challenge is you never know what your staffing is. Right, right, uh, as opposed to the career. And I'm sure Chief Ling's gonna give me a similar situation. Chief Cagno, what was the uh, apparatus response and personnel response? Uh, you got uh, three engines, uh, truck squad, uh, an EMS unit, if uh, it sounded like it was a working fire, anywhere from uh, 18 to 21. 18 to 21. Chief Burns, Framingham, Mass. Uh, very similar, Chief. Uh, if we include RIT, three engines, a truck, a heavy rescue, EMS, and a chief. Uh, so that's like 19 to 20, 22 guys. Okay, perfect. And uh, Lane, I think you said it, but just uh, feed it to me again, if you don't mind. Four pumps, two trucks, two chiefs, and uh, one EMS unit, uh, 28 people. 28 people, gotta love it. Um, Robbie, I think you also said it, but uh, give, me, give me the count again, if you don't mind. Yeah, so uh, we, would, we actually dispatch a little different based on hazard class. And uh, so like our special hazard class would get us five engines, three special services, which could be a rescue or a ladder truck, uh, three command officers, which are our EMS supervisors or battalion chiefs or district chief, which is the ship commander, and then uh, two fire medic units, which are uh, fire, which are fire ambulances. You know, have firefighters that are also ALS providers, and then uh, our air utility truck. So I, I don't even know how many guys that is. It's a lot. So, uh, but that's how we dispatch things. We don't do residential or commercial. It's all based on hazard. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Great, great SOPs, great pre-planning your response on the front end of it. And if you get that many guys there, one of the techniques you can use, if you actually stuff all of them inside, you can displace the oxygen. 
So uh, I've never had that luxury, but I think that's a that's a tactic. Uh, Chief Ling, what do you got? And you talk about daytime or, or nighttime response. How is that varied? Yeah, daytime can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, it usually doesn't affect us that bad, but um, as soon as we strike a working fire, uh, we get a fast team that comes in from a mutual aid department, as well as an engine and a ladder from a neighboring department to backfill our quarters. So we can get we can start them out to the scene right away. Um, in a perfect world, we would get, out of my department, we would get six engines, our EMS company, as well as our cyanide response team. Excellent. Excellent. And Chief Whitley, you did describe it, but just give me a quick rundown again on a, on a, on a commercial, uh, uh, commercial first alarm response. I, don't, I think they still have it for either, no matter what it is. It's five engines, two trucks. Heavy rescue, one or two BCs, depending on if it's known to be working. A medic unit, so 27 to 36 people. And the other thing is, you mentioned all these chiefs on the uh, the panel. Remember the fire pentagon. That one leg you can take away is the chief. Right, right. If you remove the chief, yeah, the fire will go out. Uh, one of the questions, and it's a great place for us to ease into uh, in our discussion, but it's generated by the chat room, and that is uh, John. Uh, John Metz has got a question, and it is, uh, on a working incident, has the safety officer on scene ever stepped in over your command in any way? So uh, I have a case history I'll talk about about that, but let's raise the specter of the safety officer. I think I want to run the panel again just to get everybody involved here. Is anybody using command teams? Um, I think Chief Hall mentioned, so he shows up as the chief of department. There is a single working battalion chief. Uh, do you jump in? Do you do whatever? How does that work? Um, one of the things that I was happy that we did uh, when I was the fire chief in North Attleboro, Mass., is we actually developed, trained together, and and worked together to create command teams. And uh uh, in the absence of an aide, and that's a great point that uh, Chief Whitley brings up, in the absence of the chief having a, a scribe or an aide or something, uh, what does your command team look like? I am a proponent of that. When we talk about multiple eyes and ears, the safety officer, um, uh, Robbie talks about the ALS piece, which I think is huge. We'll, we'll get to him in a second. But what does the command team look like and what are the roles of the assistants? And, and please, as I call upon you, uh, let's answer John's question as well as that. And that is, have you ever had a safety officer jump, jump the commander? Uh, which is legit. I mean, that can happen. That is, uh, the, it, it, hopefully it's it's well-intentioned and appropriate. But uh, Brad, how does it work? Do you have multiple commanders and what are their assignments and roles? And I don't mean sectoring off. I don't mean assigning somebody the, the Charlie side. I'm talking about a command team standing in the street in a fixed position. For us on a naval station, it really depends on what the incident is. If we're dealing with a, a working fire, that ship commander is going to come in. He's going to get a progress report from the battalion, take command from him, and then assign the battalion to a different role. If we have a train officer on duty, he or she's supposed to respond as our incident safety officer. We've never had a case where the safety officer has overstepped his bounds and taken command or interfered with the command. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Chief Hall, uh, is there, was the command team something you used? Was it not something you used? And have you ever had a safety officer uh, uh, usurp command in some way? Not usurp, that's a bad term, but, but kind of give orders uh, to, towards command. Well, firstly, uh, one of my big things was assigning somebody to operations. Uh, I needed to have, uh, I needed to have my eyes inside the building and that was through the the senior officer, the captain of the first in company, whoever it might be, uh, assigned his operations. It was a multi-level incident. I'd have first, second, third level operations and, and expand expand the uh, command module as needed. Um, an interesting story as far as safety officer uh, countermanding a command order. I actually did that myself at a working fire several years ago on Elmwood Avenue in our city when I was the safety officer and the uh, command had ordered the uh, crew to the roof, and I happened to be in a position to see that there was a large body of fire. I am a fire in the attic, and the attic was actually, the roof was actually getting soft 
and I, I did a quick face-to-face -face with the, the IC, advised him of the situation, and he, uh, he retracted the order, and I'm not going to say maybe five or six minutes later, the roof went in. Okay, so you, you were the person who, uh, who saw the uh, stuff. Uh, Joe Starnes, your thoughts on a command team? But Charlie, and again, Charlie's talking about sectoring off. That's not where I am. I'm a command team, senior advisor, safety officer with you, that kind of thing. Uh, Chief Starnes, what do you got? Um, what's your feeling on that? Do you use it? And have you ever had a situation where the safety officer uh, dove in? Well, let me take the last question first. No, I never had a safety officer redo the strategy or change the tactics on the scene. I've had them advise, but never redo it. Uh, that's what the first answer. The second is I'm a big believer in command teams, personally. Uh, my, my private industry life had that big time, and it worked really well. Uh, so uh, the whole concept of having a senior advisor, an IC, a support officer, all that, Scribe, whatever you want to call those terms, uh, was a big deal. And, and in my other world, I had a plans officer on every event. And that plans officer was just what the command module calls for to do. And they were invaluable, invaluable. So, but I haven't seen it at the volunteer level here yet. So I can't okay. speak to that, right? Okay, makes sense. Chief Cagno, did you use command teams? I know you assigned chief officers to different parts, but were you using a senior advisor, safety officer? Was there a uh, white picket fence out in the street somewhere? Uh, somewhat. Uh, you know, usually once uh, we have a working fire, you're usually getting uh, uh, the safety officer, uh, callback chief, uh, chief from a neighboring community if uh, – mutual aid companies are responding in, which is usually the case. Um, so you would have somewhat of a command team uh, assembled at some point. Okay. Uh, any case where the safety officer may have intervened? Uh, oh, never uh, in anything that I've led. Um, although uh, if it is written in the policy, if the, if the safety officer sees something uh, to be an immediate threat, uh, he, he, he can – make that call if for some reason you can't do an immediate face-to-face. -face. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of face-to-face -face with safety officers. Say it on the radio. Everybody knows it's a problem. I don't have an issue with that. Chief Burns, uh, any time a safety officer intervened and uh, what's your thoughts on using a, a safety officer command team type structure? You were probably just flying solo in many cases, right? Yes, Chief. For the most part, that's true. Uh, uh, if it was during the day, I could get some more help from even the chief of the department. Um, uh, we did have a training deputy that served as a deputy, uh, as a safety chief during the day. Um, but two o'clock in the morning, I was probably uh, running one and two alarm fires by myself for about, uh, you know, I'd say at least 30 minutes. Um, so uh, that was challenging, but so much of it, I'll just interject one quick thing, chief. Uh, so much of what we discussed here uh, has to do with how well the, the, the troops are prepared beforehand. And, and I had great guys that worked for me. Uh, they knew what I wanted. We talked a lot about what I wanted. So when I showed up, for the most part, I mean, I liked being first. I hated being second, but uh, actually, but um, my guys knew what I wanted and they were doing it for the most part. So, so much of what we talk about, I think, has to do with uh, that whole, you know, soft environment thing that we talk about from time to time, the hard environment is reflected by what goes on in the soft environment. You know, when you're training with your, your guys, you're learning their, um, their strengths, their weaknesses. And of course it all comes down to the men, Pete, uh, you know, their courage and their tactical skill, uh, is going to make me look good. So, uh, I just wanted to throw that in about, uh, all that we're talking about here is very much dependent on preparation and what goes on before the alarm comes in. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think good training and good uh, solid SOPs means that I don't have to give a lot of orders. I don't have to do things. I'm making adjustments for things that have occurred. So I don't, uh, I don't disagree with that, Chief. I think that's a good, uh, a good hit. Um, Lane, any times where the safety officer interjected, and if you do use a command team, kind of describe what those positions are, if you would. 
Um, well, yeah, we'll use a command team, uh, you know, on a second alarm that gives you four battalion chiefs and then some what we call staff support people coming in from our training division and places like that. So you get a couple extra captains and they'll, uh, they'll work your command board. You can, you can kind of you deploy them. It's instant, instant commander's discretion in terms of do they want to open up an operations section. If it's a wildland fire, you typically have one chief that just runs your, uh, your air operations for you. And then uh, if we have to open a planning section, then somebody will do that. But we'll form the BC vehicles into what we call a wagon wheel, where they back up tailgate to tailgate so we can set up a command post. With the idea being that the instant commander is not writing things on the board and talking on the radio and stuff like that. So the instant commander can truly just build situational awareness and think without having to engage in any tasks. Yeah, that's that's a mouthful. Nicely done. Um, Robbie, I'm interested in your system. Um, uh, well, Lane, you didn't answer the question about people, uh, safety, oh, officer safety officer jumping. Yeah, you know, we will have safety officers out there walking the fire ground and they, you know, can, and I've done it myself where I've stopped, uh, you know, individual company tasks out there and, and corrected that on the spot. In terms of actually stopping the operation or changing tactics, um, not that I'm aware of, although, you know, we will typically have conversations in the command post where, you know, you, <clears throat> fortunately we've been able to drill enough and that's, if you're going to have a command team, you better drill and practice with them. But, uh, we get together and we're willing to check our egos at the door and, uh, you know, say, Hey, what do you think? You think this, you think what we're doing here is going to work or should we uh, try something else? And we'll have that conversation. Excellent. Excellent. Robbie, I'm interested to hear what those positions are, how it works. I, you are using command teams and uh, just kind of describe those positions and, and uh, also answer if you've uh, had an incident where, you, where the safety officer has intervened. Yes. Yeah, so we, uh, we embrace the command team concept pretty, pretty widely. Uh, in fact, our command officers that are assigned to a shift, we call them the command team. Like when you email them, uh, you know, you're like your email, it, even like their email address is fire command team C shift. So we pretty much embrace that on an incident. You pretty much have that initial incident, uh, command officer running accountability for them. And really the, one of the big things is someone's trying to run community, like, it, especially if it's two or three, uh, someone's running communications for them. Like someone is specifically monitoring the radio and we have a, uh, breathing apparatus accountability system that is monitoring the breathing apparatus of every firefighter on the scene. So someone is like, and that takes pretty much a dedicated person. So they will, one person will run that computer, one person will help run accountability comms, and then one person will, uh, and one person will run, you know, the incident will be the incident commander. Uh, and, but any of those guys can answer for command when they're working in that command team and they, you know, and they work together as a team and answer comms and make sure nobody misses any radio traffic. Cause that is something we identified as a problem that we were missing a tremendous amount of radio traffic uh, with one person trying to run the command board or standing in the front yard. So that was uh, that was a pretty big thing. And it kind of a, a revelation for us is when we started doing the command team concept that uh, we needed somebody dedicated to communications and accountability, somebody dedicated to that uh, to that SCBA accountability system, monitoring the air, yada, so on and so forth, and then somebody truly answering up for command. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, I that was a term I used to use when we were working as a command team, and the first time I did it, communications flipped out when I said I'm answering for command. You know, they, they were all flipping out, but I'm standing in the same pool of people. I will say that I do want to write this down as a roundtable milestone. Uh, I had two speakers, one right after the other, and they were both talking about air uh, support services. One of them was flying in a plane and the other guy was talking about air packs. So we have to, you know, we have to say the right thing here. You know, air support can mean a couple different things. So uh, I appreciate it. Rob Fling, uh, do you use a command team? You've got uh, uh, volunteers coming in. Do you do you uh, do you use other chiefs? Does it work or not work or whatever? What are you thinking? Uh, generally, don't use other chiefs. There, um, they might not be uh, all that familiar with our actual procedures. Um, the assistant chiefs will generally take an operations uh, inside the building. Um, 
we have the luxury of having um, coordinators um, within the town that are actually connected to the county. Um, and you'll generally get one to two of them at every uh, work and fire. And they're not there to uh, interfere in any type of way, um, but they are um, extremely experienced as a second set of eyes. And um, I don't have to get on the radio to request anything. They're usually standing right behind you at the command post, and all you need to do is turn around and say, can I have another engine and another ladder? Um, and Or whatever you need. Um, whether it be the power company, uh, the water company, whatever you need, they'll get you. Um, and I've never had never had a an, a problem with the safety officer on scene. I've had safety officers come and bring things to my attention, which I've had to deal with, but um, never anything beyond that. Excellent. Warren, tell me what the command team looked like in your world. Uh, did you have, you know, designated uh, technical advisor or safety? How did that really kind of work? Did they have roles? And uh, have you ever had a safety officer intervene? Well, they have a safety officer respond on every alarm. And um, there's usually the, the BCs all have aides, so they become your accountability board and scribes and, and – uh, to handle some of the radio traffic depending on how big the team gets. The um, We've even had one or two incidents I can remember that were long term where the EOC was actually stood up to be the, the backstop. Um, as far as the safety guys, I don't think we've ever had anybody intervene um, at the strategic level or operational level, but they've definitely intervened at the task level you know, with crews, if they've seen them doing something, they had the power to do that. Nobody made a fuss ever. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So let's, uh, believe it or not, we have shot an hour pretty quickly here, folks. So what I'm going to ask the panel to do, and I'm going right back to you, Warren, I'm going to uh, run the panel down a uh, couple of things. Um, what do you want to say to people that are watching us from an incident command? What is a tip that you could give as an incident commander um, that would do that. And if you've got any social media presence and you want to say that, let's, uh, let's run down the panel here in the last four or five minutes. Uh, Warren, what, what do you say? What's, uh, what's something you learned as an incident commander that you could pass along? Probably the biggest thing is try to get as much situational awareness as you can get. The more you know, the better your decisions are and the better you can resource the, uh, the incident. Um, as far as social media, emails wwhitley58 at gmail, or you get a hold of me through uh, Joe at Pill the Flashover. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Warren. Chief Ling, what, uh, tell us something that you learned as an IC. Uh, leave us with a tip and uh, give us your social media presence. Uh, sure. Uh, one thing I think I learned um, as an incident, com incident commander early on was um, to listen more than I talked. Um, my guys generally would um, take 90% of the jobs and handle them um, perfectly fine if I was there or not, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, I, I had to do my job as well as they had to do their job. But um, just listen, most of the information that you can, you might hear the company officers uh, go back and forth with. Um, and they'll report back to you what um, what needs to be said 90% of the time. That being said, if there's something that you think you need to interject, uh, don't be afraid to do so. Um, email is robertdfling at gmail.com, and social media-wise, it's uh, Face Peace on at Twitter. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate it. Robbie Owens, what, what can you leave us? You're in a, you're in a growth spurt here. You're going, uh, you know, from captain, you're acting up. You've got a very progressive, large organization. You know, just for the listeners, Robbie, how big is your organization? How many personnel? Um, so we're just shy of 600 people personnel, uh, 600 uniform, rather. Um, and we have about – we're getting ready to open our 21st uh, station, uh, which is going to house an engine, ladder, and ambulance. So we have 20 – we'll have 21 engines – uh, six ladder companies, three heavy squads, and 15 fire medic units. We run four, uh, we run a, a, a shift commander, three battalion chiefs, and two EMS supervisors that help with our command team um, as well. So as uh, far as anything I've learned about being in command, I would say uh, the biggest thing is trust the company officers out there. 
Um, and I say that from being a company officer, trust what they say and then act accordingly. You know, they're going to feed you the information, kind of like Chief Bling said. Uh, they're going to feed you the good information, give them what they need and uh, believe what they say. You don't need to be, uh, you know, you don't need to be on Division One to verify what they have to say. You know, if you're in command, listen to what your guys say and uh, feed them what they can. Uh, as far as social media, uh, Average Jake Firefighter blog, uh, AverageJakeFirefighter.com and at AverageJakeFF on Twitter. All right. Thank you much, Robbie. I appreciate you being here tonight. Lane, uh, something you learned, pass something along to the folks and uh, how do we find you on social media? Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, we can all, most of us, you know, run a first alarm on a yellow legal pad from the front seat of the car and that's no big deal. But if it goes anything beyond that, get some help to get organized. Otherwise you're going to get behind the incident. You'll start losing situational awareness and um, establish trigger points in your mind. You know, have those trigger points and uh, know that, that when you're going to call that second alarm, when you're going to go defensive, give some thought in advance. So when you start hearing those trigger points, you can react to them and act accordingly. Um, as far as social media goes, uh, best place to talk fire with me is on Twitter uh, at Suncoast Chief. Excellent. Excellent. Chief Burns, uh, something you can pass on, something you can pay forward here. And uh, how do we find you on social media? Thanks, Chief. Uh if it doesn't go out with tank water, we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> uh, that was one of, that was one of my trigger points. Um, and, uh, and yeah, chief, I, I tried to always, and I never perfected this, but I always work towards just being aware of that whole domino theory. I just tried to make myself constantly aware of what can I do with the dominoes all start to fall? What can I do to stop them? Whether that's pulling the guys out of the building getting more help, um, just some, some way to stop those dominoes, which is so, you know, prevalent in those NIOSH line of duty death reports. Uh, so anyway, um, and I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter and uh, Facebook, uh, Kevin Burns. If you just search that name, you'll find me. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Chief Cagno, what do you got? Something they can take away from you and where do they find you on social media? Um. I would say that the thing that we need to think about uh, is that uh, once you reach the the the, uh, the BC level or chief level, is that uh, you, you can't uh, stop your training. I think you need to, uh, you know, to continue your command training, um, especially um, if you have bigger command uh, structure in your department. But um, that would be the takeaways. Uh, you know, don't forget that you know just because you get to that level, you need to to do. Um, continue training. And Excellent. Reach me at uh, on Twitter or Facebook or um, on uh, uh, johncagnoleader.com. All right. Joe Steins, what can you leave us with tonight and uh, how do we find you? Well, Chief, uh, leaving with you tonight, I would say practice, practice, practice. Uh, go out and, and if you drive by something, practice, practice, practice. Go see your district, practice, practice, practice. Also, if you haven't studied Alan Brunus Cini's Bless His Heart and Passed Away October the 15th, if you haven't studied his Fire Ground Command book, whether you believe in blue card or not, go study it. It's worth your time. It is worth your time. Uh, the other thing is, lastly, is that uh, the future belongs to you on a fire ground. The, your firefighters, what they're going to do next, you have to resource and take care of them. So be very aware that that, that future is yours. And thank you for having me, Chief. I appreciate it, Joe. Excellent. Uh, and Joe, you can find Joe at Kill the Flashover Project. There's, uh, there's a bunch of stuff out there. Chief Hall, what do you want to leave the listeners with? And uh, you're not a big social media guy, but uh, if you're looking to get in contact with Chief Hall, you can send an email through me and I'll, I'll push it off to, uh, to Charlie. So Charlie, what do you want to leave the listeners with? Well, actually two things. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm going to back uh, up trust. Trust in the people that you've given the responsibility to on the fire ground to get back to you with uh, accurate and concise information. Make your decisions going forward based on the information you've gotten from them. And a personal thing I used to do with the, the times that I did take command, I used to use my 51530 rule. That was something I made up myself. 
what do I expect this operation to be in five minutes? Where do I see it in 15 and where do I see it in 30? And if I don't reach those benchmarks, I have to determine what's going sideways and, and what we can do collectively to rectify that situation. All right. Sounds great. That's a good one. Five, fifteen, thirty. I like it. Brad, last and certainly not least, uh, what do you what what can you tell somebody tonight as a, as a command, you know, a, a company officer that may serve as a commander? And where do we find you on social media? I think the one thing I would take away from the company officer level is to remember you set the tone of the incident. And before you even get to that, you need to be out practicing the art of the first due diligence, knowing what you have in your area what you can expect, post stretches. Uh, and you can find me at uh, Facebook, Brad Doherty. You can search me and I'll pop up. I think after the holidays, I'm going to give my hand to Twitter and see how this works for me. I haven't been successful so far, but we'll see. So, uh, we'll, it's been a real pleasure. We'll, uh, we'll coach you off the ledge. We'll get you in off the ledge before you jump. We'll, we'll cover you. Well, thank you very much, uh, very much, everyone. Uh, we will not be here next week. We're taking the weekend after Thanksgiving off, and we'll resume the uh, first weekend in December. So I appreciate each and every person on the panel. We had a good show tonight, and uh, we will see you at the first week in November, uh, first week in December, and have a happy Thanksgiving to uh, all of the listeners that are out there.